Steve Del Vecchio has been on top of Deflategate like nobody else. You can follow the man at Steve Del Sports on Twitter. He's the assistant editor at Larry Brown Sports at LB Sports, a site that I go to every day for prep. He's kind enough to join me on the Comcast Business Hotline. Steve, thanks for the time. Aton Shander, 97.5 The Fanatic. I know that you have been doing a lot from the jump regarding Deflate Gate, and I'll say up in Boston, but that doesn't matter to me because everything that you've said and done has been very partial, I have to admit. Let's start big picture here with all the things that have come out this past week. In your opinion, what has been the most egregious thing the NFL has gotten wrong regarding Deflate Gate? Well, throughout the whole, I mean, it, it all starts with the Mortensen report, and that, you know, kind of came to light again this week um, when he canceled out on his interview with EEI. Um, I mean, there's there's a report from that station that uh, the leak came from um, former Jets executive who's NFL game day operations guy, uh, Mike Kenzel, who supposedly fed the information to Mortensen. I mean, that's bad right from the start. Oh, my God. Of him having an agenda. Um, and, you know, Mortensen didn't correct it. And it's just, I mean, it, that, that you could argue that the story wouldn't have become nearly as big as it has become without that, you know, two pounds underinflated false report from the start. Yeah, and one thing that I was hammering on before you came on today, on today's show, Steve, is how the NFL just sits there knowing that it's bad information out there regarding the 11 of 12 balls, but they, I mean, this is like some piece of propaganda that oppressive governments use, where they know that there's bad information out of the tabloids, but they sit and wait for the public opinion to form, and then they kind of swoop in when it's too late. Right, exactly, and it's exactly what you said. It's waiting for the public opinion, especially since, I mean, a lot of people argue that there's no reason that the NFL would want its poster boy to get in trouble like this or its, you know, best team of the last decade, but there's that, but there's also how many of these similar instances that the NFL has botched over the past, you know, few years with Ray Rice and a bunch of other things. So as soon as, I think as soon as that initial report came out, maybe they didn't know it was false. Maybe it was the NFL guy with an ax to grind. But as soon as that came out and became a big deal, how could they back down again and say, oh, guess what? We screwed up again, just like we did however many months ago with Ray Rice. So it's like, you know, they, they, I think they're just standing their ground and, and they refuse to, you know, admit that they were wrong because they've already been wrong so many times before that they just don't want to keep taking the bashing. So they've kind of stuck to their story and, you know, people have kind of figured it out. And, um, you know, some people have believed what they want to believe, but... Uh, that I mean, that that's a fact. You you can say opinion whether you think the Patriots are cheaters or that, but it's an absolute 100% fact that that report was false. And like you said, it's just amazing that nobody said a word about it. Steve DelVecchio joining us. Larry Brown Sports. You can follow Steve at Steve Del Sports on Twitter. He has been an authority, if not the authority, on the whole deflate gate from the jump as we continue to try to figure out what the hell's going on here. All right, so let's go on, on the point you just made, which is that the Wells report is false. Where do you begin and, and kind of take us through the process of poking through the holes in there? And maybe it's with the gauge, maybe it's just with the rules itself, but when you looked at the Wells report, when you personally looked at the Wells report, where did you begin to punch holes? Well, the Wells report itself may be true. I mean, it's there's there's a lot of, you know, misrepresentation, I think, of facts. Um, and that's the, that's the biggest thing to me is when you look at the actual chart of how the ball's measured, you take that two pounds, you know, report, that's just completely false. One of the balls was two pounds underinflated on one of the gauges that they used, which coincidentally the, uh, the official doesn't remember which gauge he used, but Wells and his cronies told the guy, oh, no, you do remember this is the gauge he used, the one that had the lower reading. So that's red flag number one. Only one of the balls on that lower gauge was two pounds under. The rest were like a pound and a half. In the Wells report itself, it talks about the ideal gas law, not to try to, you know, I know it's a sports show. I don't want to get no. All the trust me, we all know that term after the last what six months. Yeah. It seems we know that term exactly. So, so all the measurements said about I don't know it was like a range of maybe somewhere around call it a pound, pound and a half for each ball. Even in the Wells report, it said that the ideal gas law would account for X amount. So not only were they nowhere close to two pounds on there, but you know, take the ideal gas law, say however many pounds you want to count for that, call it point eight, point seven, whatever. Then when you break it down and look at it like that, you step back, take a look at what we're actually talking about here. And what we're really talking about is the Patriots supposedly intentionally deflating their balls by like, I don't know, 0.5 pounds, if not less. 
It's ridiculous that we've gotten to this point, and I'm seeing reports now that other owners in the NFL are kind of like, all right, man, this has gone too long. Like, this is absurd that we've gone, it gotten to the point of witch hunt. And have you seen Brady? Because it's interesting. You know, he's not Peyton Manning when you look at, at the public perception. And as much of a fan of I, as I am of him, I still get that he's not America's favorite uh, hero like a Peyton Manning, you know, the Papa John's and everywhere. But I will say that I've seen a transformation, and maybe this is just in, where I am in Philly, Steve, where he's turned into almost a martyr. Where it's like, okay, we get it that he may not be the greatest person we want to sit and defend. However, the NFL is clearly the bigger evil here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people are just sick of hearing about it. And, you know, there, there's just so much bad information that's come out. And it seems that the NFL is responsible for most of it. Um, another interesting thing that, that I think, you know, goes along with the point of the NFL looking bad is uh, a report I read today from Pro Football Talk said that... Um, the NFL might be inclined to settle now. They can still settle, believe it or not, before the, the judge has already urged them to try to settle before he has to look at the case. Um, and a report from uh, Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk, said that um, the NFL might be inclined to settle because the judge has basically told them, I'm not going to seal up the documents from the appeal hearing. If you if you want me to rule on the case, then I'm going to make you know everything that happened in that appeal hearing public. Obviously, after the appeal, the only thing the NFL wanted anybody to know was that Brady allegedly smashed his phone. So if those files start getting opened up now after the ruling, maybe we're going to hear, you know, the details of Brady's side of the story. Maybe we hear how him and his attorneys offered to give, you know, 10,000 phone numbers and text messages, emails over, but Goodell didn't want to take the time to look through them. So I think that, you know, if those files come out publicly, that's going to be even more bad news for the NFL because it's going to, you know, probably sway public opinion a little more and say, oh, you know what, this guy uh, actually was probably believable. What does it even matter if he got rid of his phone or not? Right. All right, so let me ask your opinion on that. What was your reaction when you heard about breaking the phone? And then the response, which is, you know, hey, I kind of break this thing every six months. Yeah, I mean, I thought that was dumb. I thought that was probably his and or his lawyer's biggest mistake. Um, especially since, you know, they said that he didn't break his last phone before this one. So, I mean, I thought he looked really bad with that, which, you know, is exactly what the NFL wanted, which is why they kind of made that a red herring. Um, I thought that was a dumb move, but there's two schools of thoughts. There's, you know, either he's that proves that he's definitely guilty, or you can say, you know, Ted Wells himself said he didn't want the phone. He just wanted relevant communications from it. Brady said, I wasn't going to give a little hand over my phone no matter what. So, when you break it down logistically, what does it even matter that he broke the phone? And, right. You know, he wasn't going to turn it over and Wells didn't want it. But it's just, you know, the the headline. And that seems to be all the NFL is in it for. Steve DelVecchio joining me, LarryBrownSports.com on the Comcast Business Hotline. I had a caller and maybe 20 minutes ago bring this up. And I remember that we talked about it on the show briefly. But wouldn't the NFL have access to the same communication if they went through McNally or Jastrzemski's phones as opposed to Brady? Why didn't they just do that if they didn't already? That's an unbelievable point, and I'm surprised that more people haven't hammered it. I've tried, but I can only do so much. I mean, the, yeah, those were those were work phones from McNally and Jastrzemski, so they didn't have a choice. They had to hand them over, and any text messages that they exchanged with Brady would have been attainable through their phones. So when they say that they wanted Brady to hand over any, you know, relevant communications, well, if they've, you know, sort of, sort of pointed the finger at McNally and Jastrzemski as being the two guys, then what other relevant relevant communications are there? The only text they got from Brady to one of those guys was him saying after the fact, like, oh, you good, Johnny? You doing okay? Which, I mean, does that prove that he's guilty? I think no matter what, when a low-level employee is involved in a massive scandal, somebody's probably going to check in on him, which is why it's also ridiculous that, people make a big deal out of the fact that their phone communications increased after the story came out. Well, of course, it was a huge story. I mean, that doesn't really prove anything. And like you said, they have his text to those two guys. So I'm not really sure if they want to know, you know, if he emailed Giselle about it or if he talked to his wife. Right. I really don't know. All right, last one, Stephen. I really appreciate you jumping on. Some great insight here to the story, especially some specifics that aren't really discussed enough. I'm going to present you my theory, the big picture theory, just to get your reaction. 
this has less and less to do with Tom Brady by the day, less and less to do with Rob Kraft and the Patriots, maybe the Patriots by the day, and more so about the presentation to TV sponsors, the presentation to big picture people that are going to be or continuing to invest money in the NFL that, hey, the game is on the up and up and people aren't cheating the game. That's why he's so hard on Brady with the four games and we see people committing crimes off the field where there's less of this isn't going to impact sponsorships. So I, I think from my big picture standpoint, this is about TV money and the sense of fair play more so than it is about Brady. Yeah, I think that's perfectly fair. And I mean, I mean, they've even said it. Uh, people have made reference. We can't have our fans, you know, thinking that they're watching an unfair product. It's fine for somebody like Greg Hardy with the Dallas Cowboys to, you know, allegedly choke his girlfriend, get suspended, whatever he was, 12 games, and his suspension suddenly gets chopped down to four, just like Brady's. But again, not the integrity of the game. Same thing with Brett Favre. He didn't turn over his cell phone with the De Jen Sturger investigation, but Goodell even says, well, that wasn't an integrity of the game issue. So I think you're absolutely right. It goes along with the money that's rolling in, and people want to know that they're throwing that money at, uh, you know, so-called fair game that's you know being played on an even field and it's definitely it's a huge perception thing and i think that's why they want to you know make an example out of it and act like they're coming down hard on it you got a funny thing about it it's just you got rogers guys who play sean king you got everybody out there being like this ain't a big deal i used to do this all the time <laughs> that's the yeah. funny part about it man yeah well, at the end of the day i've said this multiple times too i mean it's been good for business i've covered it extensively a lot of people have covered it extensively 10, 15 years from now, when people talk about it, it's going to be, oh, didn't Brady, you know, do something to a football once? Oh, yeah, whatever. He's the best ever. It's not going to matter. <laughs> LarryBrownSports.com. Steve, the assistant editor there. You can follow him on Twitter, at Steve Dell Sports, at LB Sports for Larry Brown Sports. Great stuff, Steve. Really appreciate the time today. Yeah, anytime. My pleasure. All right, you got it. Steve Del Vecchio on the Comcast Business Hotline.